a few questions? Please. I, I've got uh, two mics going around. Maybe you can pass it around. Hi, thanks. That was a great talk. Um, Thank you. How much is too much? <laughs> they're, they're just like, how much Minecraft? How much of all this is too much? How many other skills are important for, for kids of the, these kids now who, for their future life? So I think there, it's, it, I'm being very general about this, but everything in moderation, I think, seems to be uh, a general mantra that works. Uh, in our case, basically, typically speaking, they do my son. Uh, so my son and daughter are very different. My daughter actually doesn't really care about the computer much, so she doesn't do much activity there. But my son, he really likes it. But I've made it very clear as to um, sort of how much time he can spend. Uh, and while I do have to remind him, he has now gotten into the habit to basically know that, okay, I get to play this, this time every time I'm going to do my stuff. And then basically, uh, if I say stop, he'll stop. Um, it's relative to your know, own child's needs, but essentially, I don't think, for instance, that an hour is necessarily too much, at least for my child, right? Uh, because I do feel that afterwards, he feels he's happier, and that is just so much easier to get him to brush his teeth and do all the other stuff you need him to do. <laughs> so, whereas if, you know, you interrupt him because he only got 10 minutes of it, he's frustrated, then getting him to do an activity afterwards is like, oh, gee, you know, it's like, why, you know? And then, essentially, he's rebelling against you. Uh, so I feel that actually that has helped. Um, but I th it's a very relative question because children are very individual. Yeah. But is that an hour of just like gaming or are you sort of... Well, I'm trying to think of... Like I have a 13-year-old and a 7-year-old. So in his case, so. Um, he does some scratch and then he recently is very much into um, Kingdom Rush, which is basically a defense game, and he plays that a fair bit. Uh, before he was doing Lord of the Rings. So he doesn't necessarily play one game all the time, but he plays basically several games. Uh, and actually, one thing what, it might be worth sharing, his most favorite activity is to actually play games together with me when we play multiplayer games. Uh, so that's a treat for him. Uh, and I think one interesting, perhaps, thing to consider is that you know, 20 or 30 years ago, we considered you know, going out to playing soccer as the thing that dads and boys do, and they should do that. But now there's a computer as well, and there's an activity like that where we bond in a way that um, uh, we can't when we're kicking balls at each other. So, Pleasure. Um, I don't know Minecraft, but I, it was explained to me that with um, uh, children playing computer games that there was a distinction between those games that had chapters mm. and those games that kept going, like the old-fashioned SimCity. Mm. And it was, um, if you thought that your children were getting sucked into the game too much, it was better to buy them games with chapters because there'd be endpoints. Would, would you agree with that? I don't. But uh, the reason I don't agree with that is because uh, that's a bit like saying Lego has an endpoint too. And is that good or not? I don't know. I think we've, uh, for some reason, I guess, we grow up with the creative mindset that building new things out of Lego is, is better than following the instructions. Yet then, when it comes to games, following instructions seems to be better. I, I think that um, it comes with a misunderstanding as to you know, what is Minecraft or what are these games in terms of... Minecraft is a never-ending game, similar to SimCity. So you can keep playing it and keep playing it and keep playing it. Uh, and so that's why kids spend hours and hours and hours of time. But what fascinates them is not only the ability to play by themselves, but play through a community. That is, frankly, though, the part that, as parents, we do need to look out for. That's why we need to be part of it, so we can control what goes on in terms of perhaps who they're meeting or who they're playing with. That is the risk aspect. But if you know how to do that, it's fine. On the other hand, um, Minecraft is a creative process because you can share what you've made. No different than when you go and share your Lego with your friends and you build something new. And that is a real appeal. Minecraft is, that's the reason why Minecraft is so popular. It's essentially taking SimCity, but essentially making it collaborative in a virtual sense. Now, um, the chapter-based storytelling, to me, is generally passé in the industry, because uh, it's, um, well, from a business standpoint, not very profitable, because you have to keep making new chapters. Um, <laughs> uh, but from a pure design standpoint, um, today's Generation Y gamer wants to have endless play. They want to explore. So if you look at all the new type of games, everyone's talking about freeform. Very few people are talking about boxing it in. The only industry where you, people are still very story-driven 
I mean, their story, but still very sort of chapter-driven is the Japanese industry. Everyone else basically has moved on to free play uh, and sort of open, open play environments, which is generally uh, assumed to be more creative. Uh, the, there is this thing about addiction, and I think the point on that one is that so far the research seems to indicate that if someone has an addictive personality um, because of a certain thing in the brain, then basically it just you just have to watch out in general. They, there's a higher propensity for people to be alcoholics as well, or higher propensity for people to do certain things. That is something that needs to be trained. Uh, but it can't, it, it's not because of Minecraft. Minecraft will maybe just bring it out more if they already have that propensity. And that's, again, an individual thing that we as parents must um, manage. And the only way we can manage it is if we do it with them. Right. Yes? Do you turn your wireless off when you go to bed? No, in the house? I don't. I do not turn off my wireless. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Please. The only thing I have concern, I have no problem about kids playing online or whatever. They, it's what they do with their eyes. Is it really bad for their eyes? So, that is a classic Generation X comment <laughs> <laughs> that comes because we were raised by baby boomers or earlier because we grew up to uh, tube TV. Uh, from a technical standpoint, basically, it has to do with the refresh rate. So, uh, in you know, if you're used, to, if you're familiar with the old terms of NTSC and PAL, you grew up to VHS tapes and so on. That's because essentially the TV, 50 or 60 frequency hertz, meant the number of times the screen refreshed. And the tiredness comes from the fact that you're looking at the screen, and you can't really see it, but your eyes can detect it. Um, similar to how you can maybe hear certain pitches, um, and the tiredness of the eyes comes because you're watching on the screen the whole time, basically it turning and turning and turning. Um, today, with basically modern technology and the frequencies that are running, it's undetectable to that. So that level of tiredness doesn't exist. That said, looking at something with light glaring at you, of course, all the time, isn't you know, the best thing either to do it 24-7. Um, so it does need to be managed, but the, uh, and you, know, you can go on and online and research, sort of, there's a lot of topics about that, but the level of damage that was assumed that we would get from watching tube TV is exponentially smaller than that watching basically, you know, LED or LCD type uh, monitors today. Yeah. Yeah. What is your uh, personal view? Will Facebook survive? Where will Facebook be in 20 years? And are you thinking that there are any benefits of Facebook for the children? So. <clears throat> I don't think there is much difference between Facebook or message, message board or any other kind of social community. The only difference for Facebook is, technically, if you're under the age of 13, you're not allowed to use Facebook. But there is a very large, I think something like 15% of Facebook's audience is actually under the age of 13. They just lie about their age. Uh, and you can already tell, you know, because of the products that they like and the likes that seem to happen on the website and the images and photos they post. Uh, because kids actually just know how to do that. Uh, and giving the right age is not really an issue. It's more like, oh yeah, sure, just a way to get in. Uh, the reason they join Facebook is because their friends are on Facebook. So it's the whole social, uh, social thing. And it is essentially, as I said before, the equivalent of the virtual living room. And you know, in Korea, it used to be SciWorld. You know, it used to be different platforms. But they've all migrated from one to the other. Facebook is maybe the platform today. It may not be the platform tomorrow, because they've moved around before. In fact, for Gen Xs, who were earlier in technology, we used to go on IRC chat rooms, for those of you who know what that is. Um, or bulletin board systems, perhaps, right? That's where we used to hang out and, and, and geek out, I suppose. Um, so, uh, anyway, they're going to find places to hang out with their friends. And I think whether it's Facebook, or whether it's a message board, or whether it's Weibo, or whether it's WeChat, uh, we, I look at it as, as long as you... Uh, I wouldn't say educate, but as long as you're doing it with them and you're teaching them the values of how to use it, I think it's fine. Because at the end of the day, uh, they, the way I reflect on it is, you know, my parents didn't teach me anything about how to use the internet or technology or the industry I'm in at all. But they did teach me about values and they did teach me about right or wrongs and I use that same principles, essentially, to guide my life. Um, and I think the same is true for all parents. Yeah. 13. 13. 13 is a legal age, yeah. Yes. Oh, you mean? Oh, yeah. 
Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh huh. Hmm. Right. Agree. Yes. So I mean, she was just validating what I was concerned about anyway, which is that um, you know, even today, basically, an 18-year-old uh, uh, university student is finding that she's not being trained for the jobs that are in the future. And that is um, the biggest hurdle in modern education today. I mean, if you research it, every university is struggling with that very question because of the pace. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Please. Hi. Um, just back to your thought about the whole idea of um, the knowledge in the cloud and the Khan Academy and Coursera mm. and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, I watched a TED Talk recently, uh, Sugata Mitra. Sure. Right? And the I granny just wanted, cloud. Yeah, yes. I wanted your thoughts on that because <laughs> he obviously takes a, an extremist view of uh, we put the computer in the wall and the children will teach themselves and they will yes. figure it out. Yes. Um, and it in some ways negates the, act, the importance of a teacher in the classroom and how that can be, um, that yes. personal interaction is actually, well, at least in my right. opinion, is just as important. So just your thoughts on that and that whole combination of technology plus so, the learning environment. I'm a big fan of Sudarshana Mitra's work, uh, which is basically um, self-learning centers. And essentially the rough summary is that um, you put a computer there, you give them big questions, like really challenging questions that nobody, that you wouldn't think they'd be able to do, and essentially let children have at it, and they will just be creative. And uh, the granny cloud is basically a way to get um, the, gran the grandmother method of motivating children to basically keep trying by basically giving them simple encouragement. So, you know, if a kid would try something on the computer, they don't have to know what's going on. They just have to look at it and say, oh, wow, this is great. I, c I couldn't do this before and essentially keep motivating them in that method. Um, and it seems to work very well. Now, my thoughts on this one is that computers today have already that ability. If you look at, uh, have that ability to essentially do the searching and the querying. And once, you know, uh, children are very inventive, actually. When you give them something, they'll play around with it, and they can get a result quickly, which before you couldn't do, uh, because a book was either not physically available or the library wasn't available, or whichever. Physical limitations were holding us back. With a computer, physical limitations are essentially gone with internet because you're able to download any information you want. And uh, while I don't think that it is... Uh, I don't think uh, Mitra is saying that teachers are obsolete. He is saying that knowledge is obsolete, which is basically that we don't need to really learn anymore or memorize anything. We just basically need to start applying the knowledge that we can readily get from Google or anywhere else around the world, which I agree with. Uh, but the role of the teacher is no longer uh, going to be to essentially spoon-feed you uh, data, but essentially is simply to motivate you to keep learning yourself and, in his words, let the magic happen by itself. And uh, I do see it when I give my son uh, Scratch and tell him, you know, do something. He may not do exactly what I ask him to do, but something comes out that is creative and unexpected. And I think that's really what he's, it, this is all about. I'd, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Porter to uh, come on stage now. We've got time for perhaps um, three or four more questions on uh, children's learning styles in the 21st century. And then um, I'll invite the sponsors to come up and present some, uh, some gifts to the speakers today. Uh, any other questions for, for Yatsu or Dr. Louise Porter? Um, I'd, I'd be interested in some conversation between both of our speakers yeah. on um, what happens to children's social skills when they spend more time in technology, which is not always, but often an individual activity. The, the mathematics on that is they have less time to socialise. So what's the research on development of social skills and the impact on our social community? And uh, so many parents that come to us say... They've always got their face in that computer and they don't know how to talk to their friends. They haven't got any friends at school. And so I'd be really interested in conversation around that. Sure. Okay, so maybe I'll start off quickly with... Um, uh, first, I think it's a very individual question because every child or every human is different. 
And I think one thing that uh, we, at least in my observation, and some of the research would indicate that we're looking at is essentially the perspective from an extrovert, which is to say that he must be social, he must have friends. If he doesn't have friends, there's something wrong with him. But then how many people actually have a lot of friends? Or how many people are really top of their class and super social? And in fact, most of the world seems to be run by a lot of introverts who have probably a few very good friends. And I see that trait in my household with my daughter and my son. My son is an introvert. He has only one or two really good friends, and he's fine. And sort of one of the comments, you know, we were concerned. You know, we were like, oh, my goodness, you know, he, he can't make friends. He's awkward. He's, you know, a social reject. And, uh, and, and we went and we, we had, you know, counseling and, and we're trying to figure out what was going on. And, you know, there were some, some things that we needed to sort out. But basically, um, one comment that struck back was was teacher saying, well, he's sitting there by himself, but he doesn't feel lonely. He doesn't seem lonely. So what's wrong with being alone? And so I think, um, whereas my daughter, she fuels off it. And essentially what the research seems to indicate is that extroverts get energy from social activity, from friends, from recognition. Whereas for introverts, it actually does the opposite. It tires them. It basically drains them. And it's the difference between those who want to go to social parties and between those who say, social party? Eh. You know, um, I'll go say hello, be polite, because it's social courtesy, and after 10 minutes, I'm out of there. And um, I would sort of maybe answer it along those lines in terms of, I think it depends on the child, because I don't think that technology is necessarily the trigger for it. It just maybe reinforces a behavior that is already natural to, um, to, that, uh, to that child. Okay. And, and that's exactly the difference between the extroverts and introverts. But what, certainly watching some of the children uh, in the last 10 years, the introverted children are able to gatekeep better with their social contact because they, can, they don't have to do it in person. And so in some senses, their circles can widen. Uh, I'm also um, reminded of the fact that childhood has changed through the centuries, it's never been the same as it is today. And it's different in Kolkata from it is in Arnhem Land in the middle of Australia. Is it different from London, different from Hong Kong? Childhood is different everywhere. So what we're mourning is this loss of childhood, this nostalgic view we have of those good old days. And remember, in 25 years, these will be the good old days. Uh, that we, we get sentimental about childhood, but it's always changed. So yes, even if their social skills become slightly differently structured, they're not going to lose the ability to say hello and greet people and shake hands. You know, it's, but it, it might be different. We don't know yet, I think. But childhood's always changed. I think it's kind of getting better in many respects. At least we're not uh, sending them as chimney sweeps and, and uh, <laughs> yeah. down the mines at, at six years of age. So there's been some improvement. So the question is, uh, are there any websites for age-appropriate um, games for kids? Um, <clears throat> so uh, there are a few, but I would generally, the first, any game that you touch, I would suggest that you play it yourself first. Right? And I think no matter what website I give you, because if you let them go there unchecked, you'll have the same problem that you will then say, oh my goodness, he's addicted, I can't control him. Um, it is not the same as a TV. And I think that is a common error because it's like, okay, he's watching TV, I leave him alone. Actually, the computer isn't quite the same. You can leave him alone when you know what environment he's in, but you do need to, to, you do need to manage it. Uh, but there's a bunch that we can, I can give you, you know, I'll take your card and I'll send it to you afterwards. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh. It is visual today. It is. And the question was, will programming code become more visual? <laughs> yeah. Yet, so the answer is yes. I mean, uh, you know, they don't call it visual basic for no reason. Um, it is basic because there is also a difference. If you, if you go into software engineering and programming, the circles do define the difference between essentially what, I guess, derogatory is defined as a code monkey, essentially someone who just codes, right, versus an architect or an engineer. And those who are architect and engineer don't necessarily have to be the best who can code fastest, 
but they're most, the most creative. And uh, the most, let's say, famous software coders in the world describe their coding the same way that authors describe writing. So it's the same thing, really. So it's visual, it's a skill, uh, and it's only, I think, scary because we don't understand it, the same way that we look at Chinese, or maybe a Chinese looks at French and says, what's this gibberish? But it is very easy to understand. In fact, probably easier than a language because it is logical, unlike most languages. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. I'll leave it with this. <laughs> yes. Basically, the ability to unlearn and to relearn, uh, because we can't really um, predict a specific skill. They have to be able to essentially be very plastic with their brain. Yeah. In keeping in mind that 25% of children who are five years old or younger today, so 25% of five-year-olds, are going to see the 22nd century. And so we don't know what issues they're going to face in the latter half of this century. I think they, I, I'm assuming there'll be some novel issues that the world will face with nine billion people on the planet. Uh, so, literally, I agree wholeheartedly. They, they need to learn, they need to be creative. And it's one of the pushes for those of you who are talking this afternoon of why we don't, in fact, want to teach them to sit down and be quiet and be passive in classrooms because they're going to need the skills to learn and relearn as the technology changes, but as the world around them changes. I'm a bit miffed. I'm not going to see the 22nd century. I'm <laughs> cross about that. <laughs> okay, Margaret, would yeah. you like to come up and yeah. uh, close off the session? Or? Uh, maybe I'll just... Uh, short answer is, I think everything in moderation, but I do think we are hindering them because it's the environment they grow up in. And it's, it's, the other thing is, is that they see their parents do it all the time. And I frankly think it's a little hypocritical when parents can do it basically at will and then the children cannot. I don't know if that's a healthy relationship. So I think that there is a measure, you have to control it, but I don't think it's sensible, in my view, uh, that you know, young children shouldn't see it. Because I do feel that, at least with my youngest, his interaction with tablets um, is natural to him and is engaging. Um, so, anyway, that's my view. Mine too. Uh, have you seen that charming video on YouTube where the, the one-year-old is uh, trying to work the magazine? And she's pinching and she's swiping. <laughs> And, and she, and she realises that this is broken, so she goes and gets the t tablet. She can't walk yet, crawls over to the tablet, picks it up, swipes, it works, she's happy. And the, the message on the screen is, Steve Jobs has reprogrammed my child's brain to think that a magazine's an iPad that doesn't work. It's their lives. It's, it, it, it would be the equivalent of a generation or two ago saying, oh, I'm not giving this child books I'm not giving this child uh, any screen time or television. And, and it's interactive. It's so much better than television because television is a passive activity. And children sometimes need to veg out too, just as we do, because they're parking information while they're chilling. But absolutely, uh, the, the information they can access on the tablets is just its so motivating. So that's what they're doing in class, parking the knowledge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we hope so. Yes. But it's actually what they're doing while they're asleep. Um, the reason that we dream, uh, why we find our dreams illogical, is during sleep the prefrontal lobes check out uh, and while, while we're dreaming. So we can have these ridiculously illogical dreams, can't we? Um, and we're also uh, accessing the emotion centres in the brain. So these ridiculously emotional dreams that make no sense whatsoever if we happen to wake up in the middle of them to remember them. But meanwhile, 
while they're sleeping, the information is parking, and I think that's why those sleep pattern that yeah. you showed was so active, is they're actually parking the information that they've learned during the day, and it's why they do need downtime. Otherwise, their data just keeps coming in and getting lost because they've got no time to make sense of it. The way that you and I, uh, before the age of five, we have very little memory because everything we experienced, we stored but we stored it as if we were throwing it into the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet. It wasn't organised. It's still there, but it's going to be awfully hard to find. Whereas as we organised our memory um, in some kind of structure, it's now easier to locate a memory. And that's what's happening during sleep. They're parking the information in a logical section of the brain where they can find it again, as opposed to it just being thrown in the bottom drawer where, yes, it will remain, but it's going to be awfully hard to refind. So I'm sure that we're about due to, to close. Margaret yes. would like to... Yes, so it's uh, exactly 12 noon, so thank you for, for, for finishing on time.